Now Elendil and Gilgalad took counsel together, for they perceived that Sauron would grow too strong and would overcome all of his enemies one by one if they did not unite against him. Therefore they made that league, which is called the Last Alliance, and they marched east into Middle-earth and gathered a great host of elves and men. It is said that the host that was assembled was fairer and more splendid in arms than any that has since been seen in Middle-earth, and none greater has been mustered since the hosts of the Valar went against Thangorodrim. Hey there, Tolkieners. I'm Danny J. And this is Joel N. And we are Keep, Keep on, on Tolkien. And we're back uh, with episode 41. Holy shit, we're 41 episodes into this. Yeah, I think we're reveling now like every episode. Further we get, we're like, oh my yeah. gosh, guys, 41, 42, 42. We were just talking earlier, like, how did we get 40 episodes? Because 40 just hit the air today. Yeah, we were saying uh, that earlier, like, I don't even remember doing I don't doing even that. remember doing, like, <laughs> season two, yeah. But uh, today we're coming at you with something I think we've been referencing for a while. I think we've promised it, actually, we've to been, some people, Yeah, we've yeah. been promising this episode since since I don't even know when. Today we're going to be covering The Last Alliance. <laughs> wow Here we go, guys. We're going <laughs> We're going to get balls deep into this. So... What is the Last Alliance? Yeah, let's start off with basics. So this is what you'd see in the prologue of the uh, Fellowship of the Ring film, right? Yeah, that's, that's where most people will be familiar with it. Yeah, the super awesome scene where you get to see Sauron fighting on the slopes of Mount Doom with Gilgalad and Elendil. It's yeah. cool. And I'm a film guy as well. I know we've talked about this on here. Greatest movie prologue of all time. Hands down. Hands down. Hands down. Okay, so... Well, what was the Last Alliance, Joel? So, the Last Alliance was a military alliance of elves, men, and dwarves. And uh, who was there? Basically everyone. Elves, Dunedain, dwarves, middlemen, just people from all across Middle-earth. So, the subject of today is the Last Alliance. However, we're going to be talking about the overall war of the Last Alliance. Sometimes people just reference the group and some people reference oh, sure. the event. Yeah. So, we are talking about the war. We're, yeah, we're talking about the overall war. So, the, the resulting war of Last Alliance lasted from the year 3429 to 3441 of the Second Age. And that actually ends the Second Age. End game. That's the end game. Uh, well, where, where was it, Joel? So, the battles took place in and around Mordor, basically. Uh, the major battles include the Battle of Degrelad and the Siege of Baradur itself. And the uh, the Dead Marshes are actually a result of the Battle of Degrelad, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Dead Marshes are one of the the major things we get from from this. Yeah, uh, Third Age tie-in. Ba -ba -da, another one of those. And uh, well, why why was it? I guess. So ultimately, the reason was uh, it was a final effort to vanquish Sauron after his surprise return in the middle of the Second Age. Yeah. And uh, basically, that's, I mean, this is what the whole episode is going to be about. Yeah. So let's do, 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 do. How did we get here? Yeah. In order to figure out how we got to this point, we're going to have to go back pretty far. So let's go back all the way into the early Second Age. Set the dial on the time machine. So Sauron in the Second Age. That's who we're going to talk about. So about 500 years into the Second Age is when Sauron appears for the first time since the First Age. Yeah, his uh, his defeat by Baron and Luthien was the last we heard of him. Yeah. And then well, he, and then he tried to, yeah. To, yeah, he uh, showed up briefly. Briefly. To sort of make amends, and then he just dipped out. So yeah. this is really the first time we've seen Sauron in quite a while. And here's a little excerpt about that. Bereft of his lord, he fell into the folly of imitating him very slowly, beginning with fair motives, the reorganizing and rehabilitation of Middle-earth, neglected by the gods. Sauron became a reincarnation of evil and a thing lusting for complete power. And that there's a little excerpt from uh, the History of Middle-earth series, Morgoth's yeah. Ring. That's uh, volume 11 or 12. 10. Yeah, 10, yeah it's a quote there from Christopher. When he's saying bereft of his lord imitating him, they're talking about Morgoth. Right. Yeah, because this is the first time Sauron's been really around without Morgoth. Yeah. And here we go. He ends up 
just imitating him without even in- entirely meaning to. No, yeah, because remember we we talked about in our episode four, which I just recently listened to. Solid, solid episode. Yeah, yeah. So episode four, uh, our Sauron character profile, we talk about how as a Meyer he was obsessed with uh, order and efficiency, mm-hmm. and uh, that's what he because uh, th- he's not wrong. The Middle Earth was kind of neglected by the gods. It was absolutely, and yeah. especially after everything that happened with Melkor, it did need reorganizing and rehabilitation. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> but he just kind of went too far. So. This this leads Sauron to contend with the elves and men of Middle-earth, and this is what brings around the War of the Elves and Sauron. And this war uh, begins with uh, what we affectionately call on KOT, the Rings of Power scheme. Yeah. So this is when we get, you know, Celebrimbor and the Rings of Power. Yeah, and, yeah, all that goody stuff. And then, uh, as we know, the Rings of Power scheme kind of fails. It doesn't quite work out the mm-hmm. way that Sauron... I mean, he does get the nine Nazgul out of it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's a plus. That's a plus. But ultimately, it didn't do what it was meant to. But ultimately, it was just... Give him back. You know yeah. what? Give him back. Just give him back. So that leads Sauron to attempt to basically dominate Middle-earth by force. And during this time, Sauron's well- realm was the largest it had ever been. And the elves of Middle-earth suffered heavy, heavy losses. Yeah, Sauron regained control over most creatures that had served Morgoth previously, like orcs and trolls and things of that nature. He never got the dragons, though. Remember, that was the thing. Yeah, he never, never got the dragons. Never recruited the dragons. Uh, Sauron also gained power over most men in the east and the south, becoming their king god. So let's talk a little bit about Sauron and Numenor, which we talked about in our profile yeah, as well. Jump ahead a little bit. Yeah, jump a little ahead. Jump a little ahead. Uh, this is uh, Second Age, 3261. The 25th king of Numenor, who never should have been king our Farazan the golden he led a massive army to middle earth to reassert Numenorean dominance yeah i think this is around the time when uh sauron started calling himself king of men yeah and our Farazan was like no yeah. i'm the king of men right, yeah, yeah pissing off the prideful Numenorean. even though you friggin married your cousin to get, <laughs> you know <laughs> right. whatever yeah king, whatever both of you guys whatever yeah both of you guys whatever but ultimately, Sauron, realizing that he could not defeat the Numenorians with military strength, surrendered and allowed himself to be taken to Numenor as their prisoner. Because, I mean, the Numenorians, uh, as we know, they had the most powerful military, I think, ever. Just, yeah. Well, I should, I'd say probably not compared to the Valar, but... Right, 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 but yeah, we never mortals, s- yeah. Yeah, we never get to see that battle happen. Yeah. And this is like Sauron's plan B, really. It's not a bad plan, because the snake in the grass that he is, he knows he's going to be able to do shit even from behind bars. Oh, yeah. And as we know, he totally does. Totally does. The time that Sauron spent in Numenor leads to... (laughs) <laughs> the inevitable fall of uh, downfall of Numenor in Second Age thirty three nineteen, and this is known as the Alcalabeth, which is the part in this. It's in the Silmarillion, the book that's not mm-hmm. part of the Silmarillion, the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's one of the the later books in the Silmarillion. Mm-hmm. So in the story of the the Alcalabeth, uh, Sauron's body is destroyed along with the entire island of Numenor. And after that, men believed Sauron was vanquished. I mean, he went down with the island. They thought he was gone. Like, yeah. dead gone for good. For goodsies. Never coming back. He sleeps with the fishes. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> down there with Umo. <laughs> The story of the Alcalabeth does not specifically mention the One Ring much. It is suggested that Sauron left it at Baradur before being taken prisoner by Arpharazon. Yeah, I think that's something that we had actually talked about in the past. Yeah, and we didn't know the answer. We didn't know the answer. Now you know, (laughs) because it's my super short show. Do you remember that from the Disney? You didn't have cable. No. Joel man. didn't have Sorry, cable. Sorry, right over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to go, the more you know, G.I. Joe. No, there's more. There's, believe me, there's a bunch of people out there going, yeah, Mike's super short show reference. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> But uh, ultimately, if you want to know anything more about the destruction of Numenor and the, the Akalabeth, you can check out our episode 22, Kingdoms of the Dunedine, part one. Numenor. Numenor. Yeah, we were just talking about that. It was almost that was 20 episodes ago. Yeah, that was a while back now. Wow. I think that's when we started doing our best work. Kingdoms of the Dunedine is when I was like, I'm proud of the shit. Kingdoms doing. of the Dunedine was uh, one of the, I think that was one of the first like three parters that we put out that mm-hmm. we were really proud of. Yeah, exactly. I would actually refer people to them. You know what I mean? Like, Still do. I still do, yeah. We just did, actually. Referred a bunch of people to it. So as I'm sure many of you know from listening to that episode, <laughs> yeah, that the surviving Numenorians from the island after it fell 
led by Elendil and his sons, Isildur and Anarion, they sailed back over to Middle-earth, and they formed the realms in exile that are the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. Which we normally refer to, since the Dúnedain series, we say Northern Kingdom and Southern Kingdom, Yeah, usually. So yeah, Northern Kingdom being Arnor, Southern Kingdom being Gondor. Yeah. So let's uh, jump ahead to these kingdoms. A little bit of uh, Sauron's history with these guys. Elendil founded the kingdom of Arnor in Eriador in 2nd Age 3320. And Eriador was already home to a sizable Numenorean population. And uh, also they were kind of mingling with the uh, the middlemen of the Adain that were left there. Yeah. Numenor had been sailing over to Middle Earth for a while, establishing colonies. So yeah, there were yeah, already... for centuries, really, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there were already some people there. So in that same year that uh, Elendil founded Arnor in the north, his sons, Isildur and Anarion, they established the kingdom of Gondor in the south, down by the Bay of Belfalas. All right, Joel, quiz time. Okay. You wrote the Gondor episode. I did. What does Gondor mean? Something of stone, doesn't it? Land of stone. Yeah, yeah, counts. You got Land it. Of, I, was, I, I almost said city of stone, but I know that's not right. <laughs> we retain this information. Oof, man, putting, <laughs> putting me on the spot there. We were going to start doing that throughout the episode, just trying to make each other look man. like fools. <laughs> <laughs> Try to trip each other up. Somebody, I hope somebody out there is keeping score. Yeah, that's like Stump the Priest, remember? We should get, uh, in, in school we used to play Stump the Priest, ask a Catholic question that's too complicated to answer. It was fun, fun game. So the Kingdom of Gondor in the south. The Kingdom of Gondor was also, also already a home to a sizable population of men, but there were fewer faithful Numenorians in the south. The further south you went, you got more of the the black Numenorians. Yeah, those buttholes, the yeah. kingsmen. Yeah, further south you had col- whole colonies of black Numenorians like at Umbar. And those guys, they're, they've are they already been hostile towards the faithful Numenorians since... Long time. Yeah, yeah. Since, since before old, Numenor fell. Old beef. Yeah, that's old beef. <laughs> and now after Numenor has fallen, well, now these black Numenorians are just hostile to the new kingdom of Gondor. So let's go over some places to know. In Arnor, Elendil, he built the Tower of Amun-Sul, which is uh, later called Weathertop Hill. And that's where, you know, Frodo gets knifed by the Nazgul. Knifed. Stab, 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 stab. Yeah, so that served as a watchtower uh, for the Northern Kingdom. It watched their southeastern borders. And it also held one of those very, very special stones, the Seven Palantir. Yeah, it was actually the largest and most powerful one that the Northern Kingdom had. It was the one that they used uh, primarily for communicating with Gondor. Right, yeah, that was their telegram system. Beep, 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 beep. That was totally not telegram system. No, what did we call it? We had a fun name for it, Feanorian FaceTime. Remember? That was way back. Oh, yeah. Way back. <laughs> Feanorian the pa- the, FaceTime. The Palantir. They should market it as Feanorian FaceTime. Because it was basically, it was past, like, cell phone. Like, oh, yeah. The concept of talking to each other through the Palantir must have been mind-boggling yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. Like, when the telephone came out for us, that's just audio, and that was crazy. Imagine mm-hmm. if you just skipped that entirely and just went straight to FaceTime video chats. Yeah, dude. That'd be crazy. Feanorian FaceTime. Copyright KOT Podcast. In Gondor, uh, Anarion and Isildur, they built the fortified cities of Minas Anor and Minas Ithil, with the capital of Osgiliath in between, right on the river, straddling the river, as it were. Yeah, so Osgiliath uh, sitting right there in the middle. Minas Anor was sort of the it was sort of the western defense that they built at the east end of the White Mountains there, and then Minas Ithil was the eastern defenses, and they built that over in this nice, pleasant valley on the uh, west side of the Ethel Duoth. Yeah. It seemed the, like a real nice place. Yeah, right by Athelion there. Smells nice. Yeah. Yeah, Ethel Duoth, also known as the Mountains of Shadow. It was meant to uh, guard our Skiliath from anything that might pop up in Mordor again. And all three of these places also had the Palantir. Yeah, they were super efficient with communication. Yeah, dude. That's why, like, like the, why the North won the Civil War, right? You had trains and friggin' telegraphs. Like, mm-hmm. that was... That's the really the edge that they had, is being able to communicate between the new, the two kingdoms. Wow. Yeah, huge advantage. But uh, despite all these advantages, something that they did not realize is that during this whole time that we've been talking about them setting up their kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdoms, during that same time, Sauron was actually reestablishing himself in Mordor, and nobody knew. And in Second Age 3429, Sauron attacks Minas Ithil by surprise, captures it, and burns the white tree that was there. Yeah, so this is huge news. They thought that he's been dead since, you know, like Numenor. They yeah. haven't seen Sauron in forever. And all of a sudden, guess what? He's back. And he totally just took your uh, eastern fort. Like, Yeah, dude. Shit. That's like somebody took, you know, Kamchatka and Risk and you didn't even know they were playing, you know? Oh, my God. <laughs> 
Luckily, Isildur, who was uh, living in Minas Ithil, he and his family were able to escape down the river Anduin along with the sapling of the tree. I'm not quite sure how they gathered that sapling so quickly, but they managed to... They always seem to manage to get away they with the sapling. They always get the saplings. No matter yeah. what, like, the, I swear, the white trees burned on, like, three different... Two mm-hmm. or three different occasions. There's, always, always, a there's always a sapling. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, on a, another lucky note... Anarion was actually able to hold Askiliath and halt Sauron's westward advance. So even though they lost Minas Ithil, Sauron's forces stopped at Askiliath. Yeah, what a guy. I don't think Anarion gets enough credit. No, that, that's, that's a, it's not an easy place to defend. Isildur, in the meantime, he sailed uh, up north around the coast to seek help from his father, Elendil. Yeah, he made it all the way to the ocean and went up north. I like how that's faster for them. Yeah, than sailing, going across land. Yeah, sailing down south, way out west, around north to get to the North Kingdom. That sounds excessive, but yeah, yeah, that was pretty efficient for them. So let's get into what the Last Alliance, the group, is. Right? Yeah, now we get to the foundation of the Last Alliance. In Second Age, thirty-four thirty, in response to Sauron's sudden resurgence, High King Elendil of the Dúnedain formed an alliance with High King Gilgalad of the Noldor. Yeah, and that's kind of what our opening excerpt was about when they finally realized, hey, we got to do something about this. So the High Kings ultimately extend their alliance to King Durin the Fourth of the Longbeards, King Orifer of the Greenwood Elves, and King Amdir of the Lorien Elves. They just want to get the word out to everyone. And together, the kings decide to raise a great host in a balls and wieners out attempt to vanish, vanquish Sauron once and for all. The Last Alliance. The Last Alliance. So also, luckily for them, uh, because Elendil and Gilgalad took the initiative here, they actually had the luxury of time on their side. So they had some time to prepare for the battle. So both high kings began by spending two whole years just gathering their own forces. Yeah, muster the troops. Yeah, this is going to be a serious effort, so they're really taking their time putting this together. Elendil gathered all the forces of Arnor and the remnants of Isildur's forces from Gondor that uh, sailed up the coast with them, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a mixture of Dúnedain and middlemen of the Edain. Um, Anarion's forces, they were busy defending us Gilead and Minas Anor at the time. So they were down there for, for, for two years fighting. Yeah, they were just, yeah, they were just trying to fucking hold up the fort down there. Yeah. So Gilgalad gathered the forces of basically all the elves of Eriador and also the forces of Círdan from Linden. Who was that? Uh, uh, he's just this guy. Uh, Who? Círdan the ship. Círdan the ship. ship, right. Right. Remember them, guys? Remember him? What was that episode? Uh, uh, fifteen, right? Episode this 15. is our season one finale. Yeah, season one finale. Yeah. Wow, so many, so God, long. Ago. I really liked that episode too. Yeah, a lot, it's popular on YouTube for some reason. <laughs> a lot of Kirdan fans on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, Kirdan. So let's talk about the forces that Isildur tried to muster. Oh yeah. Um, and he tried to recruit the 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 men of Dunharrow, and you know they're an ancient race that lived in the White Mountains for a long time. Yeah, they were around before the Dúnedain. Before the Dúnedain. Mm-hmm. But they swore fealty to the Dúnedain. Mm-hmm. So uh, Isildur came and was like, hey, men of Dunharrow, come fight for us. And they were like, fuck yourself, dude. <laughs> nope. And they, <laughs> nope. And then uh, he cursed them. He laid a curse upon them. And he said that you must uh, forever unrest until you fill your oath. Something like that, right? Paraphrased. Paraphrased. Joel shaking his head. This is Radio Joel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you guys can't see me shaking my head. Really. <laughs> Joel's just ecstatic agreement with me, just smiling and shaking his head. Like, yeah, dude. Yeah, you got it. So that's where we get the Dead Men of Dunharrow from the Third Age. Right, right, right. A fun tie-in. There's a lot of things that come from this event. Yeah, I think that's why they explain a lot of it in The Lord of the Rings, the the book. Mm. Like, you get you get pretty much this whole story, not all of it, obviously, but the gist of this whole story in The Fellowship of the Ring from other people telling right. it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there isn't really much of a uh, direct account of this happening. No, there's not. Yeah, that's something we found out putting this episode together. There, is, there aren't really many direct narratives no. about the Last Alliance and the War of the Last Alliance. Mm-hmm. You, you get some bits from, like, Elrond at the Council of Elrond right. sort of briefly talking about it, and you you can find stuff in like the unfinished tales, but mm. I don't know if there's any like full on accounts. So this this one was fun putting together. Yeah, this was a real foraging of information. <laughs> so in the year thirty four thirty one, this is when the forces of Elendil and Gilgalad finally meet up together at the Tower of Amon Sul, and then they march eastward to Rivendell. 
In Rivendell, they're joined up by the forces of Lord Elrond. He had, uh, uh, Elrond had mustered all the troops uh, from Rivendell, who are survivors from the fall of Eregion, so they're probably still really pissed off. Oh, I'm sure there's a lot of beef for Sauron there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they've got a mix of, of elves there, too. they got Sindar and Noldor in, yeah. in Rivendell. Because it was a straight-up refugee city after. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. This is also when Elrond takes his place as Gilgalad, uh, excuse me, as Gilgalad's second in command for the coming campaign. Yeah, yeah. The alliance ultimately spent a further three years in Rivendell, and that includes forging weapons and armor, training, strategizing, and also making plans remotely with Anarion down in Osgiliath. Don't forget, they've got those Palantir. Palantir, Feanorian FaceTime. And this is when Rivendell becomes known as the Great Forge. I think we mentioned that in the Elrond episode. I think so. Yeah. I think we've mentioned it a couple times. A couple yeah, times. The, the yeah, because they really just just pump out a lot of hardware. Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of armor in a short amount of time. A lot of weapons, too. yeah. And then in Second Age, thirty four thirty four, the Alliance leave Rivendell and they travel eastward across the Misty Mountains. Yeah, thirty four thirty four is a big year. This is kind of when everything starts going down. Yeah. So they cross the mountains and then they uh, also cross the Anduin. They all kind of cross in various locations and then they all end up regrouping in the Vale of Anduin on the east side of the river. And in the Vale of the Anduin, the alliance is joined by the Sylvan forces of Amdir of Lothlorien and Orofer of the Greenwood. Yeah, and just to clarify for those that might not recall, Sylvan elves are j- is just a basically a fancy name for wood elves. Wood elves, yeah, yeah, that are the usually the Nandor variety, yeah. Yep. So uh, Amdir gathered his forces, uh, the Galadrim from Lothlorien, and that included some Nandor and some Sindar. And Orfor had his forces from Greenwood the Great, and that just included some of those Nandor elves. However, neither Amdir nor Orofer's host would take Gilgalad as their leader. <laughs> yeah, they had some, the Sylvan Elves had, had some beef with the Noldor. They had beef, yeah. I mean, the Noldor, they're kind of usurpers. Like, yeah. I like the Noldor, but, like, they did come back and, like, start changing names and, like, taking land and, like, yeah. you yeah. know. We've got a quick excerpt about uh, this beef here. Orfer assembled a great army of his now numerous people, and joining with the lesser army of Amdir of Lorien, he led the host of the Sylvan Elves to battle. The Sylvan Elves were hardy and valiant, but ill-equipped with armor or weapons in comparison with the Eldar of the West. Also, they were independent and not disposed to place themselves under the supreme command of Gilgalad. They're Americans, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, they're they're very stubborn people. We don't bend the knee to anybody, anybody. Yeah, historically, there's always been some bad blood between them. They kind of blame the Noldor for the issues with Morgoth in the first stage. Oh yeah, for sure. Because they kind of blame him for all the stuff that happened with that. And then uh, they also, yeah, like you mentioned earlier, they just don't like the fact that the Noldor left and then came back and came back and just yeah. started like taking lands and oh, yeah. saying we're your king now and giving things new names. Yeah, they didn't like that. So yeah. there, there's there's some beef there. They like to the Sylvan Elves like to be independent. After regrouping, the Alliance began heading south along the east bank of the Anduin, and they rendezvous with the forces of Durin the Fourth of Khazadum, and of course our guy Anarion of Gondor. Yeah, finally get the remaining Gondorian forces. Uh, Anarion brings up some d- more Dunedain and middlemen from Gondor, and uh, Durin has his forces of the dwarves of Khazadum, which were kind of a mix actually. They're mainly Durin's folk, but yeah, there were some other there fi- were some other because uh, firebeards or whatever. Yeah, Khazadum <laughs> was like the oldest, biggest realm. So like when Belagos and Nargrod fell, they got some of those guys too. Mm-hmm. So there was a little bit of a mix. All in all, it was said that few dwarves fought on either side, but there were dwarves on both sides. On both sides, yeah. Yeah, so Sauron had some dwarves fighting for him too. Mm -hmm. But the Durin's folk strictly were with the Alliance. As they normally are. As they normally are. They're the good ones. Mm -hmm. So now, fully gathered, the complete Alliance marches south to meet Sauron's defenses for the first time. Alliance, assemble! Let's review. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now that we've got the whole group together let's just review everyone that's actually part of the complete last alliance so the last alliance includes 
The forces of Arnor, led by High King Elendil, the remnants of Isildur's forces of Gondor, led by King Isildur, Anarion's forces of Gondor, led by King Anarion, the forces of the Elves of Eriador, led by High King Gilgalad, the forces of Rivendell, led by Lord Elrond, who is second in command for Gilgalad, the forces of the Elves of Lindon, led by Círdan the Shipwright, dun 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 dun, and uh, he's also named Lieutenant of Gilgalad. Of course. Of course, of course. And we also have the forces of the Galadrim of Lothlorien, led by King Amdir. And we also have the forces of Sylvan Elves of the Greenwood, led by Orofer. And some of the forces of the Dwarves of khazad led by Durin IV. Yeah, they've got everybody who's anybody is part of this. And we've actually got a, a quick excerpt from the Silmarillion about the uh, complete host. It is said that the host that was there assembled was fairer and more splendid in arms than any that had since been seen in Middle-earth, and none greater has been mustered since the host of the Valar went against Thangorodrim. Yeah, I can't really think of any other time when you get this many different people teaming up. Yeah, this is like the Traveling Wilburys. You know that band? <laughs> no. No. Okay. No, I don't. Well, it's, just, it's really... some of the greatest musicians of all time in the same band. It's whatever. Um, so, the Alliance goes south. And this is when we get to uh, something that is kind of sad and not talked about a lot. Yeah, this is uh, what occurs in the place called the Brownlands. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was called before the Brownlands. But that's what it's called now. But that's what it's called now. <laughs> that's what it's known as. So on that southward journey, the Alliance reaches a region of land that has recently been completely completely devastated, completely destroyed. And they I tried to look up descriptions and it basically sounds like the land was scorched, but they don't like literally yeah, like scorched. literally scorched, but they don't say exactly what happened. Yeah. It's just decimated. Okay. And uh, the Brownlands, they were originally an area of open fertile land uh, on the east side of the Anduin across from Fangorn Forest. And this this place is where the Entwives lived. And they uh, they uh, sought land for their own gardens, uh, independent of the male Ents. Look at that. Yeah. I, Ladies at taking one point, charge. I, I was reading about it, and they were saying, like, uh, I think the male Ents were, like, more into making these big, crazy trees and wild forests, and, like, the Entwives wanted to create, like, beautiful gardens and things. And yeah, yeah. For whatever reason, they, they couldn't agree, so they went and decided to make their own gardens. Yeah, because they had kind of become estranged at that point like mm -hmm. yeah 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 uh treebeard talks about him oh yes he does treebeard treebeard talks about a great deal of things yeah treebeard <laughs> is like exposition yeah exposition in a trunk <laughs> in a tree <laughs> Yeah, so ultimately at some point between the year 3431 and 3434, Sauron sent his army north, slaughtered all of the Entwives, or it's suspected because they're gone. Treebeard refuses to believe that they're all gone, but uh, they're gone. And Sauron destroyed all the land there just as an attempt to hinder or maybe intimidate the alliance. I, yeah, I would say it was probably, yeah. Uh, Some too. people suspect it was to keep the Entwives from teaming up with them. Oh, yeah. I because bet that would uh, be as a... we see in the Third Age, uh, Ents can be used to a devastating extent. Oh, yeah. They're pretty fucking nuts. Yes. Yes, they are. Stronger than trolls, even. Yeah. Because, uh, as Treebeard says, trolls are but a counterfeit of us. That was so fucking crazy when I learned that. Yeah, trolls are basically bastardized Ents. Yeah, like, uh, so like, elf is to orc what Ent is to troll. Right, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, Sauron, Morgoth, they can't create life, so they just manipulate yeah. other stuff. So all the orcs and trolls were originally something else. Cool facts. Fun facts from KOT. Back to the Brownlands. <laughs> <laughs> so we've actually got a excerpt that gives a description of the Brownlands. On the eastern bank to their left, they saw long, formless slopes stretching up and away toward the sky. Brown and withered they looked, as if fire had passed over them, leaving no living blade of green, an unfriendly waste without even a broken tree or a bold stone to relieve the emptiness. They had come to the brown lands that lay vast and desolate between southern Mirkwood and the hills of the Emin Muil. And from here the Alliance continued south until they reached the plain of Daggerlad, which is just north of the Black Gate. And this is when we get into the Battle of Daggerlad. <laughs> So this is in Second Age, 34-34. The Alliance meets Sauron forces for the first time, and he begins the most decisive battle in the war, the Battle of Daggerlad. 
Yeah, Sauron's forces are also pretty diverse, not just the Alliance. So on Sauron's side, he has Easterlings, Southerlings, Black Numenorians, Dwarves, Orcs, Goblins, Trolls, and other unnamed beasts. So this is a pretty nuts battle. I'm sure some of those Halloween-style creatures are hanging around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he's still, ma- he's still got those friends. Oh, no, vampires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, vampires and werewolves, man. I mean, he fucked with those guys in the first age. They could still be around. Yeah, they're around, I'm who, sure. Who knows? Sauron is crazy. Now, we got a quick excerpt here. They came at last upon the host of Sauron at Daggerlad, the battle plain, which lies before the gate of the Black Land. All living things were divided in that day, and some of every kind, even beasts and birds, were found in either host, save the elves only. They alone were undivided and followed Gilgalad. So yeah, that kind of drives home the point that like men are on both sides. Yeah, dwarves every- are on both yeah, sides. Everything's on yeah, both sides. Bird, beast, animal. Everybody's got into this one. Yeah, this is yeah pretty nuts. Now issues arose for the alliance when the Sylvan elves of Amdir and Orpher's forces wouldn't follow any of the commands of Gilgalad. Those, like that cake eater Gilgalad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we mentioned earlier, there was some uh, there was some beef there. We've got an excerpt about this as well. The Sylvan Elves were hardy and valiant, but independent, and not disposed to place themselves under the supreme command of Gilgalad. Their losses were thus more grievous than they need have been. Orpher was slain in the first assault upon Mordor, rushing forward at the head of his most doughty warriors before Gilgalad had given the signal for the advance. Jump the gun. Yeah, so here where we've got at the very beginning of the battle, Orpher just, yeah, just charging in prematurely. King Orpher jumped the gun. King Orpher jumped the gun. Do you recognize that? Please, that's the Beatles, Joel. Whatever. Let's oh move on. Oh my God. We're, let's, let's move forward. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite part of the show. It's just laying down just cultural references. Uh, no, just like that, just don't. Nobody understands. It's well, fine. I feel like most people probably understand the Beatles reference, but. Maybe. I don't know. They're pretty niche, you know? <laughs> so after Orifer's Orr- forces prematurely charge, Amdir's forces follow. So really, all the Sylvan elves just kind of go at once before Gilgalad gives the order. And uh, even though the the Sylvan Elves are valiant and tough, they are ill-equipped compared to the others. Orpher's host makes it all the way to the Black Gate, but once they get there, they are completely surrounded and destroyed. And Orpher is killed then and there. And further shittying up the situation, after the fall of Orpher's host, over half of Amdir's host was cut off from the rest of the Alliance, and they were driven southwest of the main battle to the nearby marshes. Down into the marshes. Into the mosh. Yeah. Remember the, the, <laughs> the Departed? When I say you put the body in the mosh, you put the body in the mosh. Yeah, and now there are going to be a lot of bodies. In the mosh. In the mosh. <laughs> this entire portion of uh, Amdir's host that goes into the marshes, they are all slaughtered there, including Amdir. And now those marshes are called the Dead Marshes because of the thousands and thousands of bodies that are just laying there undecayed undecayed which is something me and joel were talking about this earlier that's something that happens in real life when people die in swamps because of the lack of oxygen and the high uh, i think it's high acidity their bodies don't uh dissolve yeah go go online and look at bodies that are found in like bogs uh, bog bodies yeah that's what they're called yeah Mm -hmm. bog bodies look that shit up it's crazy yeah super well preserved and uh, all the remaining Sylvan Elves from both Lothorian and Greenwood are now led by Thranduil of the Greenwood the Great. He's the son of Orifer. We know yeah. that guy. Yeah, it just so happens Orifer's son, Thranduil, was also there. So now all these Sylvan Elves, they still won't follow Gilgalad. So Thranduil's like, all right, well, you guys from Lothlorien, come join us uh, from the Greenwood and we'll, we'll do this together. Let's, let's do this together. Together this time. Yeah. Yeah, so all together, finally, the rest of the alliance all joins the battle at once. And now things are a little more even, but the battle still rages for months. And there are heavy losses on both sides. But eventually, Olandil and Gilgalad do gain the upper hand, and they breach the Black Gates. (laughs) Breach it, kick it open. Elendil just kicks it open with one foot. It's just really satisfying to think about. Oh yeah, just breaching the black Bro- gate. That would have been the Because yeah, pretty much every time we come in contact with the black gates. It's just this indestructible the, yeah, force. This yeah, impenetrable. Yeah, they straight up breached it and just went right into Mordor. That's bad, pretty badass. We've actually got a uh, another excerpt here about this. 
the host of gilgalad and elendil had the victory for the might of the elves was still great in those days and the numenorians were strong and tall and terrible in their wrath against iglos the spear of gilgalad none could stand and the sword of elendil filled the orcs and men with fear for it shone with the light of the sun and the moon and it was named narsil god that's bad yeah dude those last two sentences about iglos and narsil are just fucking sweet i almost bought narsil at the convention last year oh that replica yeah it was, it was like a, 70 bucks it was a cool it was really big though yeah and it, it would have went really to cool. the with the ring doug i just got the ring oh, like the yeah. week before dude i mean your size your height plus the ring plus narsil you would totally i am be, the king of the dune you yes. would just be yeah you'd be a dune dine <laughs> dark haired yeah yeah dark hair dark eyes tall no, I'm tall, just kidding. Tall, dark, and handsome. I'm fucking. Oh, thanks, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm actually uh, five foot two, blonde, and um, you know I surf a lot. <laughs> 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 We're from Minnesota. <laughs> There's surfs up, dude. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the siege of Baradur. How about that? Yeah. So after breaching the Black Gates, the Alliance uh, successfully drove Sauron's forces all the way back to Baradur. And the remaining forces of Elendil, Gilgalad, Thranduil, and Durin went ahead and camped out on the plains of Gorgoroth and prepared for the siege of Baradur. Baradur. Yeah, I imagine they just put out their lawn chairs and their blankets. See, you ready. Like a rock concert. They're That'd just... be a pretty shitty place to put up camp. <laughs> yeah, though. what? Just anywhere in Mordor sucks. Does anybody have any water? No. God, it's dry here. It's hot. There's no, there's no water here, but there's oil. <laughs> there's there's, there's the crude oil. oil. This crude oil bubbles up from the ground. Okay, the Siege of Baradur, it started in SA 3434, that magic year. Where everything happens, where it everything seems happens. like. And it continued for seven years. A seven-year siege. Yeah. That's crazy. So that if, yeah, that would like... 2012 to 2019 would be 2012 to could you imagine that yeah that's a chunk of time that's a good chunk of time like, what were you doing in 20 i was like 21 years old or something when i was yeah that's when i had my 21st birthday <laughs> yeah. that's when i uh moved out of my parents and moved in with trevor hell yeah trevor we know trevor don't laugh what up trevor trevor yeah he was actually on our show yeah that's why i said a we know times him. yeah a couple times all right though sauron was confined within his tower he wasn't without his tricks or power the Alliance, they endured seemingly endless numbers of arrows, rocks, and flaming missiles, as well as regular counterattacks from hordes of orcs. Yeah, just like endless numbers. There must be like some kind of like tunnels and shit under Baradur, I'm sure. Well, they probably had the Great, great Earth Eaters, you know, from the Hobbit films. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> what a travesty. You genuinely had me for a second. I was like, oh. Oh, Joel was yourself. like, shit, I don't, is there something lore I don't know? And then there's like, no, it's no. non-canical. It's horseshit. Yeah, so during this siege, the Alliance continues to take many casualties. Yeah, sieges never go very well for no, either side. Not, not really for either <laughs> side, no. In the year 3440, Elendil's second son, King Anarion of Gondor, is killed when his helmet is basically crushed from a stone that was catapulted from Baradur. That's, uh, yeah, things are getting pretty metal around here. But yeah, man. Pour one out, put one hardcore. up. Pour one out, put one up for an Aryan. Poor guy. Now, one year later, in 3441, the siege actually became so intense. So this is the seventh year of the siege. It became so intense that Sauron himself emerged and joined one of the counterattacks and actually broke the Alliance's lines. Like that, he himself yeah. is just that much of a force. That's all they needed. Yeah. And, th and he, he was able to push back the Alliance. Sauron actually gained ground and pushed the Alliance all the way back to the slopes of Mount Doom. And there, on the slopes of Mount Doom, Sauron fought High King Gilgalad and High King Elendil in single friggin' combat. Yeah, this is where things get real heavy metal. This is, yeah, this is the uh, prologue, that super intense battle. Mm -hmm. And Sauron was obviously much more powerful than these he's, two. He's a Maiar. Yeah, he's a he's Maiar. A, there's no way getting around that. Yeah, but Gilgalad is killed first when Sauron scorches Gilgalad's face with the heat of his hands. Also, super metal. Oh my god! He just, I just imagine him like grabbing Gilgalad's one. face with Gilgalad just Whoa. screaming and like smoke coming out from yeah. under his hand, and then he just he's dead. Like that's just crazy. He can just kill you by touching by your touching face you. with with your with his hand. They kind of got into that with the um, the Lord of the Rings because remember when he wore the ring, you could always see the. Oh, the script. like his hands were hot. That's right. Yeah. You could always see the text, and afterward, in order to get the text, you had to throw the ring into fire. So yeah. I guess his hand was hot all the time. That's crazy. Yeah. Connecting dots, guys. We're connecting dots, dots connected. live. 
So nearby, Elrond, Círdan, and the Seal Lord just kind of helplessly watch as uh, this is all going down. Yeah, they get to see their kings slaughtered, basically. Yeah. And when Elendil dies, Narsil breaks beneath him, and uh, he falls, and he's killed. Pretty dramatic stuff. Yeah. Yeah, everything at this point has been leading up to this. Mm -hmm. The three major leaders in this whole war are now fighting hand-to-hand. Yeah, that's where it's gotten to. That's what it's gotten to. Sauron, High King Elendil, and High King Gilgalad, and both of the high kings just died just died like this is this is it after all these years of preparing and fighting it, it it's done mm-hmm. it's like everything is fucked We've and elendil's lost. sword is broken and it extinguishes the light yeah his his sword was it would actually light up we were talking about that earlier yeah shone with the light of the sun and moon but 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 yeah we were both but, like but big but big but sauron he's pretty fucked up after this battle after fighting those two motherfuckers yeah he's actually pretty wounded yeah and he's like on the ground like he's done he's down for the count he's not dead well he's not dead but he's, he's not like de- fully defeated but, but he's incapacitated he's for the pretty moment. wounded and uh isildur takes up that opportunity takes the hilt shard of narsil walks over to that motherfucker and cuts off a single finger and takes the ring yeah cuts off that one ring ring finger and then boom it's done he it's did it over separate it turns out they didn't i'm not sure if they quite realized it but separating that ring from sauron's body was enough to vanquish his physical form yeah I, th- I honestly think he just he did it just to be a douchebag and then was like damn that was cool <laughs> oh kind of like uh, <laughs> kind of like he did when he surrendered to the Numenorians like oh, no I think won. I think he sealed or cut the ring off to oh, be a douchebag oh to be a dick <laughs> he's like yeah. fuck you dude oh I'm sure yeah. that oh I mean he just saw him kill his dad I'm yeah, sure dude. he was pretty spiteful at I'd that be, point I'd be salty I'd, I'd be cheesed I'd be like <laughs> cheese is the right word to all. Cheese. use it it's cheese I'd be cheesed I'd be cheesed so after Sauron's physical form is destroyed, his armies pretty much scatter in disarray. And uh, the only thing is, though, nobody knew that Sauron's spirit still endured. They didn't quite, I guess these men of the Second Age still hadn't quite grasped the concept of the Maiar. Of the Ma- how the Maiar work. How the yeah. Maiar work with their spirits and stuff. So they they assumed once again that Sauron was dead <laughs> yeah. completely. Yeah, we did He's it. He's got to be this time. <laughs> Yeah, we did it. Woo! Third time's the charm, right? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> but at this time, Isildur actually takes the one ring. And uh, Elrond and Círdan, they counsel Isildur to destroy the ring in the cracks of doom while they're there, because uh, that's where it was made. Right. I mean, at this point, let's just get rid of every trace yeah. of Sauron that we can. Yeah, we'll pack a lunch, bro. We'll hike up the mountain yeah, some off an hour. Have a nice afternoon. Toss it in. In the crack of doom. It would be great. <laughs> As we know, ultimately, though, Isildur decides not to destroy it and he claims it as compensation for all of his losses and he has lost a lot i mean he's lost almost everything yeah we've got an excerpt here from elrond alas said elrond isildur took it as should not have been it should have been cast into the into ordruin's fire nigh at hand where it was made but few marked what isildur did he alone stood by his father in that last mortal contest and by Gilgalad only Círdan stood, and I. But Isildur would not listen to our counsel. This I will have as Weirgild for my father and brother, he said. And therefore, whether we would or no, he took it to treasure it. Yeah. But uh, as, as terrible as we know that event to be, nobody really at the time, including Elrond or the Wise, a shit Círdan, the shipwright, um, or Sildor, they really knew what the full implications of this act right. would as, be. Right. As we know, as the audience. Yeah. Spoiler that, alert. Yeah, yeah. As we know, the whole thing about keeping the ring intact was what ultimately didn't defeat Sauron. Right. Um, but they didn't know that. I mean, obviously, Círdan and, and Elrond, they're like, let's get rid of all traces of Sauron that we yeah. can they were on the right track but they i don't think they qu- quite realized how serious this was <laughs> no as yeah. uh, we come to find out later in the war of the ring mm-hmm. so at this point baradur is thrown down but the foundations remain mm. and the foundations sauron's remain. armies disperse however they're not completely destroyed so it's like they win but we're seeing all these little things now that show that planting the seeds of the war of the ring right exactly yeah we've got another quick excerpt here The servants of Sauron were routed and dispersed, yet they were not wholly destroyed. And though many men turned now from evil and became subject to the heirs of Elendil, yet many more remembered Sauron in their hearts. 
and hated the kingdoms of the west. The dark tower was leveled to the ground, yet its foundations remained, and it was not forgotten. Yeah, all those little seeds are still there. It actually turns out the foundations of Baradur couldn't be destroyed because they were actually made with the One Ring. So while the One oh. Ring remained, they couldn't destroy oh, Baradur. Once, because at the end of the Return of the King, they destroy the foundations. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Third Age tie-in. Boom. Boom. It's all coming together. Yeah, they didn't know this at the time. I, I wonder what they were thinking when they got the tower all the way down to the foundations. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, sledgehammers again, remember? It's <laughs> <laughs> just like, how, why can't we get rid of this fucking foundation? <laughs> Whatever. This is what it is. Just like. leave it. Yeah. Yeah, so they didn't quite realize the implications of that either. These are all things that, you know, we find out later. So, at this point, the alliance is done. Yeah, so it let's, is. <laughs> yeah, the War of the Last Alliance has it's, now it's over. ended at great cost to everyone. So, let's get into a little bit of the aftermath, aftermath. of the alliance. So, after Sauron's defeat in 3441, a number of notable things happened. Um, first off, this marks the end of the Second Age and the beginning of the Third Age. And the High Kingship of the Dúnedain is passed to Isildur, the eldest son of Elendil. And the title of High King of Noldor of the Noldor is ended forever. Forever. Gilgalad is the last. After the deaths of their fathers, uh, Thranduil and Amroth become kings of Greenwood and Lothlorien, respectively. And uh, as we know, Mordor is deserted for many centuries after this. It's just kind of left empty. The lands were so filled with corruption and dread that no one really dared to spend any time there. They were still scared of even just the memory of Sauron. I mean, yeah. he's, he was some fucked up shit. And this also marks the beginning of the, uh, the Golden Age of Gondor, right? The yeah, yeah, this is when Gondor really prospers. Really prospers. This is when that, from the Gondor episode, remember when they said precious stones were child's playthings? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So after the war, Isildur returned to Minas Tirith, and in the Great Library, he recorded his account of everything that happened. And this scroll is important. Yeah, this scroll is very important. It includes the only known description of the One Ring, and it also accounts for what happened to the One Ring after Sauron was defeated. Not many people even knew that Isildur had taken the ring. Right. As we find out throughout the War of the Rings, I think more or less throughout the Fellowship and stuff, they talk about this. Because this is like the information that they, Gandalf you, sought for like decades. Yeah, yeah. And they, like, they reveal what does it. the ring look like? Mm-hmm. Where did it go after Sauron fell? Nobody knew, but it was all written down on this fucking scroll. And yeah. then they just like forgot about it? Because I remember at the Council of Elrond when they bring this up, Boromir's like, oh, yeah. he, Elendil took it. That's, yeah. or uh, Isildur took it. That's great. Yeah, Boromir's like royal family of Gondor, and he didn't even know. Yeah, that. he didn't even know. Yeah, they say, like, if such tales have been told in the South, they've been long forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately, this scroll seems to have either been a secret or just completely forgotten about. Yeah, it was probably, like, holding up or, like, making a table level, you know, like sugar <laughs> packets. <laughs> That rickety-ass table in the corner over there. Put that scroll underneath it. Yeah, so as a result, this important information about the One Ring is just kind of lost somewhere in the massive records of Minas Tirith. Like we said, it takes Gandalf like decades to find it. Yeah, I love that scene. uh, They show him in the library in the, I don't know if it's in, it's in the Fellowship of the Ring, right? Mm -hmm. And he's just smoking and has candles lit and shit. And I was like, dude, you're going to burn, that's all parchment. Like, you're going to burn that fucking place down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the only people to ever read that scroll that we know of are... I mean, Elendil, because he wrote it. Or, I'm sorry, Isildur, because he wrote it. I just did the same thing, yeah. (laughs) Uh, And then Gandalf, we know, and Gandalf assumes that Saruman read it, too. So, like, this thing's super important, and, like, nobody saw it. Yeah. And uh, we know it probably Saruman read it because he was secretly searching the Gladden Fields yeah. for the ring. Which right, because he knew out. that Isildur, after reading that, he knew Isildur took it, so then he went to go find where Isildur fell. That's when. That's why he was searching Gladden Fields. Right. So, three years after the war, Isildur finally sets out from Minas Tirith and starts heading back up to Rivendell because this is where he left his wife and one of his sons. So he gets a group together, a group of soldiers, along with three, his other three sons. So he has four sons total. And they start heading up towards Rivendell. So he was anxious to get there. He wanted to get there quick. So he took the shortest route, uh, making his way north through the Vale of the Anduin. And while he was passing through a place called the Gladden Fields, they were ambushed by hundreds of orcs from the Misty Mountains in is what is known as the Disaster of the Gladden Fields. Yeah, and we have an uh, excerpt about this horrible scene. Isildur was overwhelmed by a host of orcs that lay in wait in the Misty Mountains, and they descended upon him unawares, between the Greenwood and the Great River, the Gladden Fields. There well nigh all his people were slain, and among them were his three elder sons, Elendur, 
Aratan, and Curion, Isildur himself escaped by means of the ring, for when he wore it he was invisible to all eyes. But the orcs hunted him by scent and by slot, until they came to the river and he plunged in. There the ring betrayed him and avenged its maker, for it slipped from his finger as he swam, and it was lost in the water. Then the orcs saw him as he labored in the stream, and they shot him with many arrows. And that was his end. From the ruin of the gladdened fields, three men only came ever back over the mountains after long wandering. One of these was Otar, the esquire of Isildur, who bore the shards of the sword of Elendil. And he brought them to Valendil, the heir of Isildur, who being but a child had remained in Rivendell. But Narsil was broken, and its light extinguished, and it has not yet been reforged again. So after, at this point, the ring is now in the bottom of the river of Anduin, and it's there for around two and a half millennia. And that's... Uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> where we're going to leave with the Alliance. That's pretty much everything that led up to the Alliance, the Alliance itself, and uh, the, the, main, the main aftermath yeah. thereof. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a hell of an event. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. It's was, it was very interesting. This this outline was very interesting. I liked it. Good, good job, Joel. Yeah, I mean, we got a lot of things from the last times. We got the dead marshes, the dead men of Dunhoro, mm-hmm. the disaster of Gladden Fields. Yeah, that secret scroll that yeah. Sealdor made that nobody knew about. Yeah, there was a there was a ton of shit and just some cool all action stuff. with all the fighting. Oh, side note, mm. Narsil signed is shined with the sun and the moon, right? Right. We were talking so about this. Yeah. We were trying to figure out if Anduril did too right Mm -hmm. and we found a really awesome quote where it says it's shown with white fire so we we're assuming that it does glow yeah in case anybody out there was wondering yeah if when it's reforged if it does glow there is evidence to support that yes yeah which is really cool i was just kind of blown away by that because i hadn't realized until this point that either narsil or andrew i didn't realize that that blade had ever glown yeah yeah yeah. because glowing blades is uh, simply an elf thing it's an elf thing yeah, yeah but telkar made He's a dwarf, yeah. And made Narsil, and it's a, so that's dwarven technology, and that's weird, because I've never heard of any of the dwarves making something, well, weapons anyways. I've never heard of the dwarves making any weapons that yeah, shown like that. Yeah. They 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 make, like, physical lamps that can mm-hmm. glow. Yeah. But uh, I've never heard of them making swords that glow. That was really cool. Yeah. Food for thought, guys. I know there's somebody out there that wanted to know. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for listening to Keep on Tolkien, guys. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed this episode on The Last Alliance. Yeah, yeah. And make sure you follow us on social media. That's uh, at KOT Podcast on Twitter. If you want to follow my goofy ass, uh, Danny, it's uh, Danny J K O T at Danny J K O T. Excuse me. That's how Twitter works. And I can be a little vulgar and a little opinionated and share some weird stuff sometimes. So, a little warning. Um, also, follow us on Facebook. And don't forget to join the KOT Talk group to ask questions and discuss with other listeners. Yeah, I believe it's Keep on Tolkien Talk and it's attached to the main page there. There's yeah. a lot of fun discussions going on there yeah, with just listeners. Post and stuff. memes and stuff in there too. You know, anything that you think other oh, Tolkien yeah. fans would like. Go ahead and follow us on Instagram too at Keep on Tolkien Podcast. And be sure to subscribe to us on SoundCloud or iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Stay up to date with our new episodes, and if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and rate us and maybe give us a short review. Yeah. If you like us, give us a little review. If you like don't... It, like and subscribe. Yeah, like and subscribe, Hit guys. that like button. Smash that like button. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. If you like us, let, write us a review. It makes us feel really good inside. I don't know. When I'm very sad, mm-hmm. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I, <laughs> I have one thing, the, the podcast, and I'm like, people are enjoying it, and it mm-hmm. makes me feel good. Yeah, it so, is. It is. It does make us feel good about ourselves. Yeah. We didn't think that this was going to be something that people enjoyed that much. But. Yeah. So please help us uh, justify our own meager existence uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and write us a review. And we also wanted to throw out a thank you to our patrons on Patreon. You guys have yes. been helping us a lot. Uh, as yes. of now, this is this is still a DIY podcast. You know, we still pay out of pocket to make this happen, which you know we're okay with doing. We want to do this for you guys, but uh, yeah, yeah. The the help we get through Patreon is it subsidizes so much. It's it's it subsidizes us and it really helps. It really keeps us going sometimes. And this uh, uh, donating would it. It, it helps us uh, create great new content with the same level of quality mm-hmm. because we do pay our editor because he does a fantastic freaking job. He does a great job. Um, and subscribing can also unlock some uh, some cool little exclusive content. Uh, we are almost always pretty fucked up when we do it. <laughs> it's almost and, always not safe for work content. And yes, it is definitely not safe for work. Yeah, it's just we have fun with it. We have fun. So, yeah, if you want to check that out, please do. Thank you so much for giving, guys. 
And um, so that's pretty much it for us today. I am Danny J. And I am Joel N. As always, guys, keep, keep on, on talking. Ah, Ray and Tuluva.